All right. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Where is my book? Time for some 1984. And then we've got mm, about 60-ish pages left. It'll probably take me two sittings. I know. Most people, 60 pages, I can read that in 15 minutes. Well, not me. Especially not reading it out loud. <clears throat> so, we are just starting into part three. This is the final part of the book. And we're so we'll be on chapter one. And <clears throat> in case you don't remember, um, Winston has now been captured. So... That's where we're at. All right. Chapter one. He did not know where he was. Presumably, he was in the Ministry of Love, but there was no way of making certain. He was in a high-ceilinged, windowless cell with walls of glittering white porcelain. Concealed lamps flooded it with cold light, and there was a low, steady humming sound, which he supposed had something to do with the air supply. A bench or shelf, just wide enough to sit on, ran around the wall, broken only by the door and at the, op at, at the end opposite the door, a lavatory pan with no wooden seat. There were four telescreens, one in each wall. There was a dull aching in his belly. It had been there ever since they had bundled him into the, the closed van and driven him away. But he was also hungry with a gnawing, unwholesome kind of hunger. It might be 24 hours since he had eaten. It might be 36. He still did not know. Probably never would know whether it had been morning or evening when they arrested him. Since he was arrested, he had not been fed. He sat as still as he could on a narrow bench with his hands crossed on his knee. He had already learned to sit still. If you, had unex if you made unexpected movements, they yelled at you from the telescreen. But the craving for food was growing upon him. What he longed for, above all, was a piece of bread. He had an idea that there were a few bread crumbs in the pockets of his overalls. It was even possible, he thought, he thought this because from time to time something seemed to tickle his leg, that there might be a sizable bit of crust there. 
In the end, the temptation to find out overcame his fear. He slipped a hand into his pocket. Smith, yelled a voice from the telescreen. 6079, Smith, W, hands out of pockets in the cells. He sat still again, his hands crossed on his knee. Before being brought here, he had been taken to another place, which must have been an ordinary prison or <clears throat> a temporary lockup used by the patrols. He did not know how long he had been there, some hours at any rate. With no clocks and no daylight, it was hard to gauge the time. It was a noisy, evil-smelling place. They had put him in a, into a cell similar to the one he was in now, but filthy, dirty, and at all times crowded by 10 or 15 people. The majority of them were common criminals, but there were a few political prisoners among them. He had sat silent against the wall, jostled by dirty bodies, too preoccupied occupied by fear and the pain in his belly to take much interest in his surroundings, but still noticing the astonishing difference in demeanor between the party prisoners and the others. The party prisoners were always silent and terrified, but the ordinary criminals seemed to care nothing for anybody. They yelled insults at the guards, fought back fiercely when their belongings were impounded, wrote obscene words on the floor, ate smuggled food which they produced from mysterious hiding places in their clothes, and even shouted down the telescreen when it tried to restore order. On the other hand, some of them seemed to be on good terms with the guards, called them by nicknames, and tried to wheedle cigarettes through the spy hole in the door. The guards, too, treated the common criminals with a certain forbearance, even when they, even when they had to handle them roughly. There was much talk about the forced labor camps to which most of the prisoners expected to be sent. It was all right in the camps, he gathered, as long as you had good contacts and knew the ropes. There was bribery, favoritism, and racketeering of every kind. There was homosexuality and prostitution. There was even illicit alcohol distilled from potatoes. The positions of trust were given only to the common criminals, especially the gangsters, and the murderers who formed a sort of aristocracy. All the dirty jobs were done by the politicals. <clears throat> there was a constant come and go of prisoners of every description, drug peddlers, thieves, bandits, black marketeers, drunks, prostitutes. Some of the drunks were so violent that the other prisoners had to combine to suppress them. An enormous wreck of a woman, aged about 60, with great tumbling breasts and thick coils of white hair which had come down in her struggles was carried in kicking and shouting by four guards who had hold of her one at each corner they wrenched off the boots with which she had been trying to kick them and dumped her down across winston's lap almost breaking his thigh bones the woman hoisted herself upright and followed them out with a yell of f bastards then noticing that she was Sitting on something uneven, she slid off Winston's knees onto the bench. Uh, sorry, kind of lost my place there. Beg pardon, dearie, she said. I wouldn't have sat on you, only the buggers put me there. They don't know how to treat a lady, they do they? She paused, patted her breast, and belched. Pardon, she said. I ain't myself, quite. She leant forward and vomited copiously on the floor. That's better, she said, leaning back with closed eyes. Never keep it down, that's what I say. Keep it, get it up while it's fresh on your stomach, like. Ugh. She revived, turned to make another, take another look at Winston, and seemed immediately to take a fancy to him. She put a vast arm around his shoulder and drew him towards her, breathing beer and vomit into his face. "'What's your name, dearie?' she said. "'Smith,' said Winston. "'Smith,' said the woman. "'That's funny. My name's Smith, too. "'Why,' she added sentimentally, "'I might be your mother.' "'She might,' thought Winston, "'be his mother. "'She was about the right age and physique, "'and it was probable that people "'changed somewhat after twenty years "'in a forced labor camp. "'No one else had spoken to him. "'To a surprising extent, "'the ordinary criminals ignored the party prisoners.' the pullets, they called them, and with a sort of uninterested contempt. The party prisoners seemed terrified of speaking to anybody, and above all, of speaking to one another. 
Only once, when two party members, both women, were pressed close together on the bench, he overheard amid the din of, amid the din of voices a few hurriedly whispered words, and in particular a reference to something called Room 101, which he did not understand. It might be two or three hours ago that they had brought him here. The dull pain in his belly never went away, but sometimes it grew better and sometimes worse, and his thoughts expanded or contracted accordingly. When it grew worse, he thought only of the pain itself and of his desire for food. When it grew better, panic took hold of him. There were moments when he, saw, he foresaw the things that would happen to him with such actuality that his heart galloped and his breath stopped. He felt the smash of truncheons on his elbows and iron-shod boots on his shins. He saw himself groveling on the floor, screaming for mercy through broken teeth. He hardly thought of Julia. He could not fix his mind on her. He loved her and could and would not betray her, but that was only a fact known, known as he knew the rules of arithmetic. He felt no love for her, and he hardly even... What? Hold on. He loved her and would not betray her, but that was only a fact known as he knew the rules of arithmetic. He felt no love for her, and he hardly even wondered what was happening to her. <clears throat> okay. He thought oftener of O'Brien with a flickering hope. O'Brien might know that he had been arrested. The Brotherhood, he had said, never tried to save its members, but there was the razor blade. They would send the razor blade if they could. There would be perhaps five seconds before the guard would rush into the cell. The blade would bite into him with a sort of burning coldness, and even the fingers that held it would be cut to the bone. Everything came back to his sick body, which shrank, trembling from the smallest pain. He was not certain that he would use the razor blade, even if he got the chance. It was more natural to exist from moment to moment, accepting another ten minutes' life, even with the certainty that there was torture at the end of it. Sometimes he tried to calculate the number of porcelain bricks in the walls of the cell. It should have been easy, but he always lost count at some point or another. More often he won wondered where he was and what time of day it was. At one moment he felt certain that it was broad daylight outside, and at the next equally certain that it was pitch darkness. In this place he knew in instinctively the lights would never be turned out. It was a place with no darkness. He saw now why O'Brien had seemed to recognize the illusion. In the Ministry of Love there were no windows. His cell might be at the heart of the building or against its outer wall. It might be ten floors below ground or thirty above it. He moved himself mentally from place to place and tried to determine by the feelings of his body whether he was perched high in the air or buried deep underground. There was a sound of marching boots outside. The steel door opened with a clang. A young officer, a trim, black, uniformed figure who seemed to glitter all over with polished leather and whose pale, straight-featured face was like a wax mask, stepped smartly through the doorway. He motioned to the guards outside to bring in the prisoner they were leading. The poet Ampleforth shambled into the cell. The door clanged shut again. Ampleforth made one or two uncertain movements from side to side as though having some idea that there was another door to go out of, and then began to wander up and down the cell. He had not yet noticed Winston's presence. His troubled eyes were gazing at the wall about a meter above the level of Winston's head. He was shoeless. Large, dirty toes were sticking out of the holes in his socks. He was also several days away from a shave. A scrubby beard covered his face to the cheekbones, giving him an air of, a rough, of ruffianism that went oddly with his large, weak frame and nervous movements. Winston roused himself a little from his lethargy. He must speak to Ampleforth and risk the yell from the telescreen. It was even conceivable that Ampleforth was the bearer of the razor blade. Ampleforth, he said. There was no yell from the telescreen. Ampleforth paused, mildly startled. His eyes focused themselves slowly on Winston. Ah, Smith, he said. You too? What are you in for? To tell you the truth, he sat down awkwardly on the bench opposite Winston, there is only one offense, is there not, he said. And have you committed it? 
Apparently I have. He put a hand to his forehead and pressed his temples for a moment, as though trying to remember something. These things happen, he ba began vaguely. I've been able to recall one instance, a possible instance. It was an indiscretion, undoubtedly. We were producing a definitive edition of the poems of Kipling. I allowed the word God to remain at the end of a line. I could not help it. He added, almost indignantly, raising his face to look at Winston. It was impossible to change the line. The rhyme was Rod. Do you realize that there are only twelve rhymes to Rod in the entire language? For days I had r racked my brains. There was no other rhyme. The expression on his face changed. <clears throat> the annoyance passed out of it, and for a moment he looked almost pleased. A sort of intellectual warmth. The joy of the pedant who has found out some useless fact shown through the dirt and scrubby hair. Has it ever occurred to you, he said, that the whole history of English poetry has been determined by the fact that the English language lacks rhymes? No, that particular thought had never occurred to Winston, nor in its circumstances did it strike him as very important or interesting. Do you know what time of day it is, he said? Ampleforth looked startled again. I had hardly thought about it. They arrested me. It could be two days ago, perhaps three. His eyes flitted around, around the walls as though he half expected to find a window somewhere. There is no difference between night and day in this place. I do not see how one can calculate the time. They talked desultory, desultorily for some minutes. Then, without apparent reason, a yell from the telescreen bade them to be silent. Winston sat quietly, his hands crossed. Ampleforth, too, too large to sit in comfort on the narrow bench, fidgeted from side to side, clasping his lank hands first round one knee, then round the other. The telescreen barked at him to keep still. Time passed. Twenty minutes, an hour. It was difficult to judge. Once more, there was a sound of boots outside. Winston's entrails contracted. Soon, very soon, perhaps in five minutes, perhaps now, the tramp of boots would mean that his own turn had come. The door opened. The cold-faced young officer stepped into the cell. With a brief movement of the hand, he indicated Ampleforth. Room 101, he said. Ampleforth marched clumsily out between the guards, his face vaguely perturbed uncomprehending. What seemed like a long time passed. The pain in Winston's belly had revived. His hand sagged, his, I'm sorry, his mind sagged round and uh, round on the same trick, like a ball f falling again and again into the same series of slots. He had only six thoughts, the pain in his belly, a piece of bread, the blood, and the screaming, O'Brien, Julia, the razor blade. There was another spasm in his entrails. The heavy boots were approaching. As the door opened, the wave of air that it created brought in a powerful smell of cold sweat. Parsons walked into the cell. He was wearing khaki shorts and a sports shirt. This time Winston was startled into self-forgetfulness. You here, he said. Parsons gave Winston a glance in which there was neither interest nor surprise, but only misery. He began walking jerkily up and down, evidently unable to keep still. Each time he straightened his pudgy knees, it was apparent that they were trembling. His eyes had a wide-open, staring look, as though he could not prevent himself from gazing at something in the middle distance. "'What are you in for?' said Winston. "'Thought crime,' said Parsons, almost blubbering. The tone of his voice implied at once a complete admission of his guilt and a sort of incredulous horror that such a word could be applied to himself. He paused opposite Winston and began eagerly appealing to him. You don't think they'll shoot me, do you, old chap? They don't shoot you if you haven't actually done anything. Only thoughts, which you can't help. I know they give you a fair hearing. Oh, I trust them for that. They'll know my record, won't they? You know what kind of chap I was. Not a bad chap in my way. Not brainy, of course, but keen. I tried to do my best for the party, didn't I? I'll get off with five years, don't you think? Or even ten. Ten years. 
A chap like me could make myself pretty useful in a labor camp. They wouldn't shoot me for going off the rails just once. Are you guilty? said Winston. Of course I'm guilty, cried Parsons, with a servile glance at the telescreen. You don't think the party would arrest an innocent man, do you? His frog-like face grew calmer, and even took on a slightly sanctimonious expression. Thought crime is a dreadful thing, old man, he said sen sententiously. It's insidious. It can get hold of you without you even knowing it. Do you know how it got hold of me? In my sleep. Yes, that's a fact. There I was, working away, trying to do a, my bit. Never knew I had any bad stuff in my mind at all. And then I started talking in my sleep. Do you know what they heard me saying? He sank his voice, like someone who is obliged to for medical reasons, to utter an obscenity. Down with Big Brother. Yes, I said that. Said it over and over again, it seems. Between you and me, old man, I'm glad they got me before it went any further. Do you know what I'm going to say to them when I go up before the tribunal? Thank you, I'm going to say. Thank you for saving me before it was too late. Who denounced you, said Winston. It was my little daughter, said Parson, with a sort of doleful pride. She listened at the keyhole, heard what I was saying, and nipped off to the patrols the very next day. Pretty smart for a nipper of 7A. Eh? I don't bear her any grudge for it. In fact, I'm proud of her. It shows I brought her up in the right spirit, anyway. He made a few more jerky movements up and down, several times casting a longing glance at the lavatory pan. Then he suddenly ripped down his shorts. Excuse me, old man, he said. I can't help it. It's the waiting. He plumped his large posterior into the lavatory pan. Winston covered his face with his hands. Smith, yelled the voice from the telescreen. 6079 Smith W, uncover your face. No face is covered in the cells. Winston uncovered his face. Parsons used the lavatory loudly and abundantly. It then turned out that the plug was defective and the cell stank abominably for hours afterwards. Parsons was removed. More prisoners came and went. Mysteriously, one, a woman, was consigned to room 101, and Winston noticed, seemed to shrivel and turn a different color when she heard the words. A time came when, if it had been morning when he was brought here, it would be afternoon, or if it had been afternoon, then it would be midnight. There were six prisoners in the cell, men and women. All sat very still. Opposite Winston, there was a, there sat a man with a chinless, toothy face, exactly like that of some large, harmless rodent. His fat, mottled cheeks were so pouched at the bottom that it was difficult not to believe that he had little stores of food tucked away there. His pale gray eyes flitted timorously from face to face and turned quickly away again when he caught anyone's eye. The door opened and another prisoner was brought in, whose appearance sent a momentary chill through Winston. He was a commonplace, mean-looking man who might have been an engineer or technician of some kind, but what was startling was the em emaciation of his face. It was like a skull. Because of its th thinness, the mouth and eyes looked disproportionately large, and the eyes seemed filled with a murderous, unappeasable hatred of somebody or something. The man sat down on the bench at a little distance from Winston. Winston did not look at him again, but the tormented skull-like face was as vivid in his mind as though it had been straight in front of his eyes. Suddenly he realized what was the matter. The man was dying of starvation. The same thought seemed to occur almost simultaneously to everyone in the cell. There was a very faint stirring all the way round the bench. The eyes of the chinless man kept flitting toward the skull-faced man, then turning guiltily away, then being dragged back by an irresistible attraction. Presently, he began to fi fidget on his seat. At last he stood up, waddled clumsily across the cell, dug down into the pocket of his overalls, and with an unabashed air held out a grimy piece of bread to the skull-faced man. There was a furious, deafening roar from the telescreen, the chinless man jumped in his tracks. The skull-faced man had quickly thrust his hands behind his back, as though demonstrating to all the world that he refused the gift. Bumstead, roared the voice. 2713, Bumstead, J, let fall that piece of bread. 
The chinless man dropped the piece of bread on the floor. Remain standing where you are, said the voice. Face the door. Make no movement. The chinless man obeyed. His large, pouchy cheeks were quivering uncontrollably. The door clanged open. As the young officer entered and stepped inside, there emerged from behind him a short, stumpy guard with enormous arms and shoulders. He took his stand opposite the chinless man, and then, at a signal from the officer, let free a frightful blow with all the weight of his body behind it, full in the chinless man's mouth. The force of it seemed almost to knock him clear of the floor. His body was flung across the cell and fetched up against the base of the lavatory seat. For a moment he lay as though stunned, with dark blood oozing from his mouth and nose. A very faint whimper, whimpering, or squeaking, which seemed unconscious, came out of him. Then he rolled over and raised himself unsteadily on hands and knees. Amid a stream of blood and saliva, the two halves of a dental plate fell out of his mouth. The prisoners sat very still, their hands crossed on their knees. The chinless man climbed back into his place. Down one side of his face, the flesh was darkening. His mouth had swollen into a shapeless, cherry-colored mass with a black hole in the middle of it. From time to time, a little br blood dripped onto the breast of his overalls. His gray eyes still flitted from face to face more guiltily than ever, as though he were trying to discover how much the others despised him for his humiliation. The door opened. With a small gesture, the officer indicated the skull-faced man. Room 101, he said. There was a gasp and a flurry at Winston's side. The man had actually flung himself on his knees on the floor with his hand clasped together. Comrade, officer, he cried, you don't have to take me to that place. Haven't I told you everything already? What else is it you want to know? There's nothing I wouldn't confess, nothing. Just tell me what it is and I'll confess straight off. Write it down and I'll sign it. Anything, not room 101. Room 101, said the officer. The man's face, already very pale, turned to color Winston would not have believed possible. It was definitely, unmistakably, a shade of green. Do anything to me, he yelled. You've been starving me for weeks. Finish it off and let me die. Shoot me. Hang me. Sentence me to 25 years. Is there somebody else you want me to give away? Just say who it is and I'll tell you anything you want. I don't care who it is or what you do to them. I've got a wife and three children. The biggest of them isn't six years old. You can... Take the whole lot of them and cut their throats in front of my eyes, and I'll stand by and watch it, but not room 101. Room 101, said the officer. The man looked frantically round at the other prisoners, as though with some idea that he could put another victim in his own place. His eyes settled on the smashed face of the chinless man. He flung out a lean arm. That's the one who ought to be taking you ought to be taking, not me, he shouted. You didn't hear what he was saying after they bashed his face. Give me a chance and I'll tell you every word of it. He's the one that's against the party, not me. The guard stepped forward. The man's voice rose to a shriek. You didn't hear him, he repeated. Something went wrong with the telescreen. He's the one you want. Take him, not me. The two sturdy guards had stooped to take him by the arms. But just at this moment, he flung himself across the floor of the cell and grabbed one of the iron legs that supported the bench. He had set up a wordless howling like an animal. The guards took hold of him to wrench him loose, but he clung on with the astonishing strength. For perhaps 20 seconds, they were hauling at him. The prisoners sat quiet, their hands crossed on their knees, looking straight in front of them. The howling stopped. The man had... No breath left for anything except hanging on. Then there was a different kind of cry. A kick from a guard's boot had broken the fingers of one of his hands. They dragged him to his feet. Room 101, said the officer. The man was led out, walking unsteadily, with head sunken, nursing his crushed hand. All, all the fight had gone out of him. A long time passed. If it had been midnight when the skull-faced man was taken away, it was morning. If morning, it was afternoon. Winston was alone and had been alone for hours. The pain of sitting on the narrow bench was such that often he got up and walked about, unreproved by the telescreen. 
The piece of bread still lay where the chinless man had dropped it. At the beginning, it needed a hard effort not to look at it, but presently hunger gave way to thirst. His mouth was sticky and evil-tasting. The humming sound and the unwavering white light in, induced a sort of faintness, an empty feeling inside his head. He would get up because the ache in his bones was no longer bearable, and then would sit down again almost at once because he was too dizzy to make sure of staying on his feet. Whenever his physical sensations were a little under control, the terror returned. Sometimes, with a fading hope, he thought of O'Brien and the razor blade. It was thinkable that the razor blade might arrive concealed in his food, if he were ever fed. More dimly, he thought of Julia. Somewhere or other, she was suffering perhaps far worse than he. She might be screaming with pain at this moment. He thought, if I could save Julia by doubling my own pain, would I do it? Yes, I would. But that was merely an intellectual decision, taken because he knew that he ought to take it. He did not feel it. In this place, you could not feel anything except pain and foreknowledge of pain. Besides, was it possible when you were actually suffering it to wish for any reason that your own pain should increase? But that question was not answerable yet. The boots were approaching again. The door opened. O'Brien came in. Winston started to his feet. The shock of the sight had driven all caution out of him. For the first time in many years, he forgot the presence of the telescreen. They've got you too, he cried. They got me a long time ago, said O'Brien, with a mild, almost regretful irony. He stepped aside. From behind him, there emerged a broad-chested guard with a long black truncheon in his hand. You know this, Winston, said O'Brien. Don't deceive yourself. You did know it. You have always known it. Yes, he saw now. He had always known it. But there was no time to think of that. All he had eyes for was the truncheon in the guard's hand. It might fall anywhere, on the crown, on the tip of the ear, on the upper arm, on the elbow. The elbow. He had slumped to his knees, almost paralyzed, clasped the stricken elbow with his other hand. Everything had exploded into yellow light. Inconceivable, inconceivable that one blow could cause such pain. The light cleared, and he could see the other two looking down at him. The guard was laughing at his contortions. One question, at any rate, was answered. Never, for any reason on earth, could you wish for an increase of pain. Of pain, you could wish only one thing, that it should stop. Nothing in the world was so bad as physical pain. In the face of pain, there are no heroes, no heroes, he thought over and over as he writhed on the floor, clutching use uselessly at his disabled left arm. And that's the end of chapter one. I'm going to take a quick pause and I will be right back.
Okay, let's get back to the book. Chapter 2. He was lying on something that felt like a camp bed, except that it was higher off the ground and that he was fixed down in some way so that he could not move. Light that seemed stronger than usual was falling on his face. O'Brien was standing at his side, looking down at him intently. At the other side of him stood a man in a white coat holding a hypodermic syringe. Even after his eyes were open, he took in his surroundings only gradually. He had the impression of swimming up into this room from some quite different world, a sort of underwater world far beneath it. How long he had been down there, he did not know. Since the moment when they arrested him, he had not seen darkness or daylight. Besides, his memories were not continuous. There had been times when consciousness, even the sort of consciousness that one has in sleep, had stopped dead and started again after a blank interval. But whether the interval were days or weeks or only seconds, there was no way of knowing. With that first blow on the elbow, the nightmare had started. Later, he was to realize that all that then happened was merely a preliminary, a routine interrogation to which nearly all prisoners were subjected. There was a long range of crimes, espionage, sabotage, and the like, to which everyone had to confess as a matter of course. The confession was a formality, though the torture was real. How many times he had been beaten, how long the beatings had continued, he, he could not remember. Always there were five or six men in black uniforms at him simultaneously. Sometimes it was fists, sometimes it was truncheons, sometimes it was steel rods. Sometimes it was boots. There were times when he rolled about the floor as shameless as an animal, writhing his body this way and that in an endless, hopeless effort to dodge the kicks, and simply inviting more and yet more kicks in his ribs, in his belly, on his elbows, on his shins, in his groin, in his testicles, on the bone at the base of his spine. There were times when it went on and on until the cruel, wicked, unforgivable thing seemed to him not that the guards continued to beat him, but he, that he could not force himself into losing consciousness. There were times when his nerves so forsook him that he began shouting for mercy even before the beating began. When the mere sight of a fist drawn back for a blow was enough to make him pour forth a confession of real and imaginary crimes, there were other times when he started out with the resolve of confessing nothing, when every word had to be forced out of him between gasps of pain, and there were times when he feebly tried to compromise, when he said to himself, I will confess, but not yet. I must hold out till the pain becomes unbearable. Three more kicks, two more kicks, and then I will tell them what they want. Sometimes he was beaten till he could hardly stand, then flung like a sack of potatoes onto the stone floor of a cell, left to recuperate for a few hours, and then taken out and beaten again. There were also longer periods of recovery. He remembered them dimly, because they were spent chiefly in sleep or stupor. He remembered a cell with a plank bed, a sort of shelf sticking out from the wall, and a tin wash basin, and meals of hot soup and bread, and sometimes coffee. He remembered a surly barber arriving to scrape his chin and crop his hair, and business-like, unsympathetic men in white coats feeling his pulse, tapping his reflexes, turning up his eyelids, running harsh fingers over him in search for broken bones, and shooting needles into his arm to make him sleep. The beatings grew less frequent and became mainly a threat, a horror to which he could be sent back at any moment when his answers were unsatisfactory. His questioners now were not ruffians in black uniforms, but party intellectuals, little rotund men with quick movements and flashing spectacles who worked on him in relays over periods which lasted, he thought, he could not be sure, 10 or 12 hours at a stretch. These other questioners saw to it that he was in constant slight pain, but it was not chiefly pain that they relied on. They slapped his face, wrung his ears, pulled his hair, 
made him stand on one leg, refused him leave to urinate, shone glaring lights in his face until his eyes ran with water. But the aim of this was simply to humiliate him and destroy his power of arguing and reasoning. Their real weapon was the merciless questioning that went on and on, hour after hour, tripping him up, laying traps for him, twisting everything that he said, convicting him at every step of lies and self-contradiction until he began weeping as much from shame as from nervous fatigue. Sometimes he would weep half a dozen times in a single session. Most of the time they screamed abuse at him and threatened at every hesitation to deliver him over to the guards again. But sometimes they would suddenly change their tune, call him comrade, appeal to him in the name of Ingsoc and Big Brother, and ask him sorrowfully whether even now he had not enough loyalty to the party left to make him wish to undo the evil he had done. When his nerves were in rags after hours of questioning, even this appeal could reduce him to sniveling tears. In the end, the nagging voices broke him down more completely than the boots and fists of the guards. He became simply a mouth that uttered a hand that signed, whatever was demanded of him. His sole concern was to find out what they wanted him to confess, and then confess it, quickly, before the bullying started anew. He confessed to the assassination of eminent, eminent party members, the distribution of seditious pamphlets, embezzlement of public funds, sale of military secrets, sabotage of every kind. He confessed that he had been a spy in the pay of the East Asian government as far back as 1968. He confessed that he was a religious believer, an admirer of capitalism, and a sexual pervert. He confessed that he had murdered his wife, although he knew, and his questioners must have known, that his wife was still alive. He confessed that for years he had been in personal touch with Goldstein and had been a member of an underground organization which had included almost every human being he had ever known. It was easier to confess everything and implicate everybody. Besides, in a sense, it was all true. It was true that he had been the enemy of the party, and in the eyes of the party there was no distinction between the thought and the deed. There were also memories of another kind. They stood out at his mind disconnectedly, like pictures with blackness all around them. He was in a cell which might have been either dark or light, because he could, not, could see nothing except a pair of eyes. Near at hand, some kind of instrument was ticking slowly and regularly. The eyes grew larger and more luminous. Suddenly, he floated out of his seat, dived into the eyes, and was swallowed up. He was strapped into a chair surrounded by dials under dazzling lights. A man in a white coat was reading the dials. There was a tramp of heavy boots outside. The door clanged open. The wax-faced officer marched in, followed by two guards. Room 101, said the officer. The man in the white coat did not turn around. He did not look at Winston either. He was looking only at the dials. He was rolling down a mighty corridor, a kilometer wide, full of glorious golden light, roaring with laughter and shouting out confessions at the top of his voice. He was confessing everything, even the things he had succeeded in holding back under the torture. He was relating the entire history of his life to an audience who knew it already. With him were the guards, the other questioners, the men in white coats, O'Brien, Julia, Mr. Charrington, all rolling down the corridor together and shouting with laughter. Some dreadful thing which had lain embedded in the future had somehow been skipped over and had not happened. Everything was all right. There was no more pain. The last detail of his life was laid bare, understood, forgiven. He was start, starting up from the plank bed in the half certainty that he had heard O'Brien's voice. All through his interrogation, although he had never seen him, he had had the feeling that O'Brien was at his elbow, just out of sight. It was O'Brien who was directing everything. It was he who set the guards on to Winston and who had prevented them from killing him. It was he who decided when Winston should scream with pain, when he should have a respite, when he should be fed, when he should sleep, when the drugs should be pumped into his arm. It was he who asked the questions and suggested the answers. It, he was the tormentor. He was the protector. He was the inquisitor. He was the friend. 
and once Winston could not remember whether it was in drugged sleep or in normal sleep or even in a moment of wakefulness, a voice murmured in his ear, Don't worry, Winston, you are in my keeping. For seven years I have watched over you. Now the turning point has come. I shall save you. I shall make you perfect. He was not sure whether it was O'Brien's voice, but it was the same voice that had said to him, We shall meet in the place where there is no darkness, in that other dream seven years ago. He did not remember any ending to his inter interrogation. There was a period of blackness, and then the cell, or room, in which he now was had gradually materialized around him. He was almost flat on his back and unable to move. His body was held down at every essential point. Even the back of his head was gripped in some manner. O'Brien was looking down at him gravely and rather sadly. His face seemed, seen from below, looked coarse and worn, with pouches under the eyes and tired lines from nose to chin. He was older than Winston had thought him. He was perhaps forty-eight or fifty. Under his hand there was a dial with a lever on top and figures running round the face. I told you, said O'Brien, that if we met again it would be here. Yes, said Winston. Without any warning except a slight movement of O'Brien's hand, a wave of pain flooded his body. It was a frightening pain because he could not see what was happening, and he had the feeling that some mortal injury was being done to him. He did not know whether the thing was really happening or whether the effect was electrically produced. But his body was being wrenched out of shape. The joints were being slowly torn apart. Although the pain had brought the sweat out on his forehead, the worst of all was the fear that his backbone was about to snap. He set his teeth and breathed hard through his nose, trying to keep silent as long as possible. You are afraid, said O'Brien, watching his face that in another moment something is going to break. Your especial fear is that it will be your backbone. You have a vivid mental picture of the vertebrae snapping apart and the spinal fluid dripping out of them. That is what you are thinking, is it not, Winston? Winston did not answer. O'Brien drew back the lever on the dial. The wave of pain receded almost as quickly as it had come. That was 40, said O'Brien. You can see that the numbers on the dial run up to 100. Will you please remember throughout our conversation that I have it in my power to inflict pain on you at any moment and to whatever degree I choose? If you tell me any lies or attempt to pre prevaricate in any way or even fall below your usual level of intelligence, you will cry out with pain instantly. Do you understand that? Yes, said Winston. O'Brien's manner became less severe. He resettled his spectacles thoughtfully and took a pace or two up and down. When he spoke, his voice was gentle and patient. He had the air of a doctor, a teacher, even a priest, anxious to explain and persuade rather than to punish. I am taking trouble with you, Winston, he said, because you are worth trouble. You know perfectly, perfectly well what is the matter with you? You have known it for years, though you have fought against the knowledge. You are mentally deranged. You suffer from a defective memory. You are unable to remember real events, and you persuade yourself that you remember other events which never happened. Fortunately, it is curable. You have never cured yourself of it because you did not choose to. There was a small effort of the will that you were not ready to make. Even now I am well aware you are clinging to your disease under the impression that it is a virtue. Now we will take an example. At this moment, which power is Oceania at war with? When I was arrested, Oceania was at war with East Asia. With East Asia, good. And Oceania has always been at war with East Asia, has it not? Winston drew in his breath. He opened his mouth to speak and then did not speak. He could not take his eyes away from the dial. The truth, please, Winston, your truth. Tell me what you think you remember. I remember that until only a week before I was arrested, we were not at war with East Asia at all. We were in alliance with them. The war was against Eurasia. That had lasted four years. Before that, O'Brien stopped him with a movement of the hand. Another example, he said. 
Some years ago, you had a very serious delusion indeed. You believed that three men, three one-time party members named Jones, Aronson, and Rutherford, men who were executed for treachery and sabotage after making the fullest possible confession, were not guilty of the crimes they were charged with. You believed that you had seen unmistakable documentary evidence proving that their confessions were false. There was a certain photograph about which you had a hallucination. You believed that you had actually held it in your hands. It was a photograph something like this. An oblong slip of newspaper had appeared between O'Brien's fingers. For perhaps five seconds, it was within the angle of Winston's vision. It was a photograph, and there was no question of its identity. It was the photograph. It was another copy of the photograph of Jones, Aronson, and Rutherford at the party function in New York, which he had chanced upon eleven years ago and promptly destroyed. For only an instant it was before his eyes, then it was out of sight again. But he had seen it. Unquestionably, he had seen it. He made a desperate, agonizing effort to wrench the top half of his body free. It was impossible to move so much as a centimeter in any direction. For the moment, he had even forgotten the dial. All he wanted was to hold the photograph in his fingers again, or at least to see it. It exists, he cried. No, said O'Brien. He stepped across the room. There was a memory hole in the opposite wall. O'Brien lifted the grating. Unseen, the frail slip of paper was whirling away on the current of warm air. It was vanishing in a flash of flame. O'Brien turned away from the wall. Ashes, he said. Not even identifiable ashes. Dust. It does not exist. It never existed. But it did exist. It does exist. It exists in memory. I remember it. You remember it. I do not remember it, said O'Brien. Winston's heart sank. That was doublethink. He had a feeling of deadly helplessness. If he could have been certain that O'Brien was lying, it would have would not have seemed to matter, but it was perfectly possible that O'Brien had really forgotten the photograph, and if so, then already he would have forgotten his denial of remembering it and forgotten the act of forgetting. How could one be sure that it was simple trickery? Perhaps that lunatic dislocation in the mind could really happen. That was the thought that defeated him. O'Brien was looking down at him speculative, speculatively. More than ever, he had the air of a teacher taking pains with a wayward but promising child. There is a party slogan dealing with the control of the past, he said. Repeat it, if you please. Who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the present controls the past, repeated Winston obediently. Who controls the present controls the past, said O'Brien, nodding his head with slow approval. Is it your opinion, Winston, that the past has real existence? Again, the feeling of helplessness descended upon Winston. His eyes flitted towards the dial. Not, he not only did not know whether yes or no was the answer that would save him from pain, he did not even know which answer he believed to be the true one. O'Brien smiled faintly. You are no metaphysician, Winston, he said. Until this moment, you had never considered what it is meant by existence. I will put it more precisely. Does the past exist concretely in space? Is there somewhere or, or other a place, a world of solid objects, where the past is still happening? No. Then where does the past exist, if at all? In records, it is written down. In records and... In the mind, in human memories. In memory, very well, then. We, the party, control all records and we control all memories. Then we control the past, do we not? But how can you stop people remembering things? cried Winston again, momentarily forgetting the dial. It is involuntary. It is outside oneself. How can you control memory? You have not controlled mine. O'Brien's manner grew stern again. He laid his hand on the dial. On the contrary, he said, you have not controlled it. That is what has brought you here. You are here because you have failed in hum humility, in self-discipline. You would not make the act of submission, which is the price of sanity. You preferred to be a lunatic, a minority of one. Only the di disciplined mind can see reality, Winston. You believe that reality is something objective. 
external, existing in its own right. You also believe that the nature of reality is self-evident. When you delude yourself into thinking that you see something, you assume that everyone else sees the same thing as you. But I tell you, Winston, that reality is not external. Reality exists in the human mind and nowhere else. Not in the individual mind, which can make mistakes, and in any case, soon perishes. Only in the mind of the party, which is collective and immortal. Whatever the party holds to be the truth is truth. It is impossible to see reality except by looking through the eyes of the party. That is the fact that you have got to relearn, Winston. It needs an act of self-destruction, an effort of the will. You must humble yourself before you can become sane. He paused for a few moments, as though to allow what he had been saying to sink in. Do you remember, he went on, writing in your diary, freedom is the freedom to say that two plus two make four? Yes, said Winston. O'Brien held up his left hand, his back, its back towards Winston, with the thumb hidden and the four fingers extended. How many fingers am I holding up, Winston? Four. And if the party says that it is not four but five, then how many? Four. The word ended in a gasp of pain. The needle of the dial had shot up to 55. The sweat had sprung out all over Winston's body. The air tore into his lungs and issued again in deep groans, which even by clenching his teeth he could not stop. O'Brien watched him, the four fingers still extended. He drew back the lever. This time the pain was only slightly eased. How many fingers, Winston? Four. The needle went up to sixty. How many fingers, Winston? Four. Four. What else can I say? Four. The needle must have risen again, but he did not look at it. The heavy stern face and the four fingers filled his vision. The fingers stood up before his eyes like pillars, enormous, blurry, and seemed to vibrate, but unmistakably four. How many fingers, Winston? Four. Stop it. Stop it. How can you go on? Four. Four. How many fingers, Winston? Five. 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 No, Winston, that is no use. You are lying. You still think there are four. How many four fingers, please? Four. Five. Four. Anything you like. Only stop it. Stop the pain. Abruptly, he was sitting up with O'Brien's arm around his shoulders. He had per perhaps lost consciousness for a few seconds. The bonds that had held his body down were loosened. He felt very cold. He was shaking uncontrollably. His teeth were chattering. The tears were rolling down his cheeks. For a moment, he clung to O'Brien like a baby, curiously comforted by the heavy arm round his shoulders. He had the feeling that O'Brien was his protector, that the pain was something that came from outside, from some other source, and that it was O'Brien who would save him from it. You are a slow learner, Winston, said O'Brien gently. How can I help it? He blubbered. How can I help seeing what is in front of my eyes? Two and two are four. Sometimes, Winston, sometimes they are five. Sometimes they are three. Sometimes they are all of them at once. You must try harder. It is not easy to become sane. <laughs> He laid Winston down on the bed. The grip of his limbs tightened again. But the pain had ebbed away and the trembling had stopped, leaving him merely weak and cold. O'Brien motioned with his head to the man in the white coat, who had stood immobile throughout the proceedings. The man in the white coat bent down and looked closely into Winston's eyes, felt his pulse, laid an ear against his chest, tapped here and there. Then he nodded to O'Brien. Again, said O'Brien. The pain flowed into Winston's body. The needle must be at least seventy, seventy-five. He had shut his eyes this time. He knew that the fingers were still there and still four. All that mattered was somehow to stay alive until the spasm was over. He had ceased to notice whether he was crying out or not. The pain lessened again. He opened his eyes. O'Brien had drawn back the lever. How many fingers, Winston? Four. I suppose there are four. I would see five if I could. I am trying to see five. Which do you wish, to, to persuade me that you see five or really to see them? Really to see them. Again, said O'Brien. 
Perhaps the needle was 80, 90. Winston could not intermittently remember why the pain was happening. Behind his screwed up eyelids, a forest of fingers seemed to be moving in a sort of dance, weaving in and out, disappearing behind one another and reappearing again. He was trying to count them. He could not remember why. He knew only that it was impossible to count them and that this was somehow due to the mysterious identity between five and four. The pain died down again. When he opened his eyes, it was to find that he was still seeing the same thing. Innumerable fingers, like moving trees, were still streaming past in, their, in either direction, crossing and recrossing. He shut his eyes again. How many fingers am I holding up, Winston? I don't know. I don't know. You will kill me if you do that again. Four, five, six, in all, honestly, I don't know. Better, said O'Brien. A needle slid into Winston's arm. Almost in the same instant, a blissful healing warmth spread all through his body. The pain was already half forgotten. He opened his eyes and looked up gratefully at O'Brien. At sight of the heavy, lined face, so ugly and so intelligent, his heart seemed to turn over. If he could have moved, he would have stretched out a hand and laid it on O'Brien's arm. He had never loved him so deeply as at this moment, and not merely because he had stopped the pain. The old feeling that at bottom it did not matter whether O'Brien was a friend or an enemy had come back. O'Brien was a person who could be talked to. Perhaps one did not want to be loved so much as to be understood. O'Brien had tortured him to the edge of lunacy, and in a little while it was certain he would send him to his death. It made no difference. In some sense that went deeper than friendship. They were intimates. Somewhere or other, although the actual words might never be spoken, there was a place where they could meet and talk. O'Brien was looking down at him with an expression which suggested that the same thought might be in his own mind. When he spoke, it was in an easy conversational tone. Do you know where you are, Winston? He said. I don't know. I can guess in the ministry of love. Do you know how long you've been here? I don't know. Days, weeks, months. I think it's months. And why do you imagine that we bring people to this place? To make them confess. No, that is not the reason. Try again. To punish them. No, exclaimed O'Brien. His voice had changed extraordinarily and his face had suddenly become both stern and animated. No, not merely to extract your confession, not to punish you. Shall I tell you why we have brought you here? To cure you, to make you sane. Will you understand, Winston, that no one whom we bring to this place ever leaves our hands uncured? We are not interested in those stupid crimes that you've committed. The party is not interested in the overt act. The thought is all we care about. We do not merely destroy our enemies, we change them. Do you understand what I mean by that? He was bending over Winston. <clears throat> His face looked enormous because of its nearness and hideously ugly because it had, was seen from below. Moreover, it was filled with a sort of exaltation, a lunatic intensity. Again, Winston's heart sank. If it had been possible, he would have cowered deeper into the bed. He felt certain that O'Brien was about to twist the dial out of sheer wantonness. At this moment, however, O'Brien turned away. He took a pace or two up and down. Then he continued less vehemently. The first thing for you to understand is that in this place there are no martyrdoms. You have read of the religious persecutions of the past. In the Middle Ages, there was the Inquisition. It was a failure. It set out to eradicate heresy and ended it by perpetuating it. For every heretic it burned at the stake, thousands of others rose up. Why was that? Because the Inquisition killed its enemies in the open and killed them while they were still unrepentant. In fact, it killed them because they were unrepentant. Men were dying because they would not abandon their true beliefs. Naturally, all the glory belonged to the victim and all the shame to the Inquisitor who burned him. Later in the 20th century, there were the totalitarians, as they were called, they were the German Nazis and the Russian Communists. The Russians persecuted heresy more cruelly than the Inquisi Inquisition had done, and they imagined that they had learned from the mistakes of the past. They knew, at any rate, that one must not make martyrs. 
Before they expose their victims to public trial, they deliberately set themselves to destroy their dignity. They wore them down by torture and solitude until they were despicable, cringing wretches, confessing whatever was put in their mouths, covering themselves with abuse, accusing and sheltering behind one another, whimpering for mercy. And yet, after only a few years, the same thing had happened over again. The dead men had become martyrs, and their degradation was forgotten. Once again, why was it? In the first place, because the confessions that they had made were obviously extorted and untrue. We do not make mistakes of that kind. All the confessions that are uttered here are true. We make them true. And above all, we do not allow the dead to rise up against us. You must stop imagining that posterity will vindicate you, Winston. Posterity will never hear of you. You will be lifted clean out from the stream of history. We will turn you into gas and pour you into the stratosphere. Nothing will remain of you, not a name in a registry, not a memory in a living brain. You will be annihilated in the past as well in this, as the future. You will never have existed. Then why bother to torture me, thought Winston, with a momentary bitterness. O'Brien checked his step as though Winston had uttered the thought aloud. His large, ugly face came nearer, with the eyes a little narrowed. You are thinking, he said, that since we intend to destroy you utterly, so that nothing that you say or do can make the smallest difference, in that case, why do we go to the trouble of interrogating you first? That is what you were thinking, wasn't it? Was it not? Yes, said Winston. O'Brien smiled slightly. You are a flaw in the pattern, Winston. You are a stain that must be wiped out. Did I not tell you just now that we are different from the persecutors of the past? We are not content with negative obedience, nor even with the most abject submission. When finally you surrender to us, it must be your own free will. We do not destroy the heretic because he resists us. As long as he resists us, we never destroy him. We convert him. We capture his inner mind. We reshape him. We turn all evil and all illusion out of him. We bring him over to our side, not in appearance, but genuinely, heart and soul. We make him one of ourselves before we kill him. It is intolerable to us that an erroneous thought should exist anywhere in the world, however secret and powerless it may be. Even in the instant of death, we cannot permit any deviation. In the old days, the heretic walked to the stake still a heretic proclaiming his her heresy, exulting in it. Even the victim of the Russian purges could carry rebellion locked up in his skull as he walked down the passage waiting for the bullet. But we make the brain perfect before we blow it out. The command of the old despotism was, Thou shalt not. The command of the totalitarians was, Thou shalt. Our command is, Thou art. No one whom we bring to this place, ever stands out against us. Everyone is washed clean, even those three miserable traitors in whose innocence you once believed, Jones, Aronson, and Rutherford. In the end, we broke them down. It, I took part in their interrogation myself. I saw them gradually worn down, whimpering, groveling, weeping, and in the end, it was not the pain or fear, only with penitence. By the time we had finished with them, they were only the shells of men. They were, there was nothing left in them except sorrow for what they had done and love of Big Brother. It was touching to see how they loved him. They begged to be shot quickly so they could die while their minds were still clean. His voice had grown almost dreamy. The exaltation, the lunatic enthusiasm, was still in his face. He is not pretending, thought Winston. He is not a hypocrite. He believes every word he says. What most oppressed him was the consciousness of his own intellectual inferiority. He watched the heavy yet graceful form strolling to and fro in and out of the range of his vision. O'Brien was a being in all ways larger than himself. There was no idea that he had ever had or could have that O'Brien had not long ago known, examined, and rejected. <clears throat> His mind contained Winston's mind. But in that case, how could it be true that O'Brien was mad? It must be he, Winston, who was mad. O'Brien halted and looked down at him. His voice had grown stern again. 
Do not imagine that you will save yourself, Winston, however completely you surrender to us. No one who has once gone astray is ever spared. And even if we chose to let you live out, live out the natural term of your life, still you would never escape from us. What happens to you here is forever. Understand that in advance. We shall crush you down to the point from which there is no coming back. Things will happen to you from which you could not recover. If you lived a thousand years, Never again will you be capable of ordinary human feeling. Everything will be dead inside you. Never again will you be capable of love or friendship or joy of living or laughter or curiosity or courage or integrity. You will be hollow. We will squeeze you empty and then we shall fill you with ourselves. He paused and signed to the man in the white coat. Winston was aware of some heavy piece of apparatus being pushed into place behind his head. O'Brien had sat down beside the bed so that his face was almost on a level with Winston's. Three thousand, he said, speaking over Winston's head to the man in the white coat. Two soft pads, which felt slightly moist, clamped themselves against Winston's temples. He quailed. There was pain coming, a new kind of pain. O'Brien laid a hand reassuringly, almost kindly, on his. This time it will not hurt, he said. Keep your eyes fixed on mine. At this moment, there was a devastating explosion, or what seemed like an explosion, though it was not certain whether there was any noise. There was undoubtedly a blinding flash of light. Winston was not hurt, only prostrated. Although he had already been lying on his back when the thing happened, he had a curious feeling that he had been knocked into that position. A terrific, painless blow had flattened him out. Almost something, also something had happened inside his head. As his eyes regained their focus, he remembered who he was and where he was and recognized the face that was gazing into his own. But somewhere or other, there was a large patch of emptiness, as though a piece had been taken out of his brain. It will not last, said O'Brien. Look me in the eyes. What country is Oceania at war with? Winston thought. He knew what was meant by Oceania and what he himself, that he himself was a citizen of Oceania. He also remembered Eurasia and East Asia, but who was at war with whom he did not know. In fact, he had not been aware that there was any war. Don't remember. Oceania is at war with East Asia. Do you remember that now? Yes. Oceania has always been at war with East Asia. Since the beginning of your life, since the beginning of the party, since the beginning of history, the war has continued without a break. Always the same war. Do you remember that? Yes. Eleven years ago, you created a legend about three men who had been condemned to death for treachery. You pretended that you had seen a piece of paper which proved them innocent. No such piece of paper ever existed. You invented it, and later you grew to believe in it. You remember now the very moment at which you first invented it. Do you remember that? Yes. Just now I held up the fingers of my hand to you. You saw five fingers. Do you remember that? Yes. O'Brien held up the fingers of his left hand with the thumb concealed. There are five fingers there. Do you see five fingers? Yes. And he did not, and he did see them. For a fleeting instant, before the scenery of his mind changed, he saw five fingers, and there was no deformity. Then everything was normal again, and the old fear, the hatred, and the bewilderment came crowding back in. But there had been a moment, he did not know how long, thirty seconds perhaps, of luminous certainty, when each new suggestion of O'Brien's had filled up a patch of emptiness and become absolute truth. And when two and two could have been three as easily as five, if that were what was needed. It had faded out before O'Brien had dropped his hand, but though he could not recapture it, he could remember it as one remembers a vivid experience at some period of one's life when one was, in effect, a different person. You see now, said O'Brien, that it is at any rate possible. Yes, said Winston. O'Brien stood up with satisfied air. Over to his left, Winston saw the man in the white coat 
break an ampule, and draw back the plunger of a syringe. O'Brien turned to Winston with a smile. In almost the old manner, he resettled his spectacles on his nose. Do you remember writing in your diary, he said, that it did not matter whether it I was a friend or an enemy, since I was at least a person who understood you and could be talked to. You were right. I enjoy talking to you. Your mind appeals to me. It resembles my own mind, except that you happen to be insane. Before we bring the session to an, to an end, you can ask me a few questions if you choose. Any question I like? Anything. He saw that Winston's eyes were upon the dial. If I, it is switched off. What is your first question? What have you done with Julia, said Winston. O'Brien smiled again. She betrayed you, Winston, immediately, unreservedly. I have seldom seen anyone come over to us so promptly. You would hardly recognize her if you saw her. All her rebelliousness, her deceit, her folly, her dirty-mindedness, everything has burned, been burned out of her. It was a perfect conversion, a textbook case. You tortured her? O'Brien left his, this unanswered. Next question, he said. Does Big Brother exist? Of course he exists. The party exists. Big Brother is the embodiment of the party. Does he exist in the same way as I exist? You do not exist, said O'Brien. Once again, the sense of helplessness assailed him. He knew or he could imagine the arguments which proved his own non-existence, but they were nonsense. They were only a play on words. Did not the statement, you do not exist, contain a logical absurdity? But what use was it to say so? His mind shriveled as he thought of the unanswerable, mad arguments with which O'Brien would, would demolish him. I think I exist, he said wearily. I am conscious of my own identity. I was born and I shall die. I have arms and legs. I occupy a particular point in space. No other solid object can occupy the same point simultaneously. In that sense, does Big Brother exist? It is of no importance. He exists. Will Big Brother ever die? Of course not. How could he die? Next question. Does the Brotherhood exist? That, Winston, you will never know. If we choose to set you free when you, we have finished with you, and if you live to be 90 years old, still you will never learn whether the answer to that question is yes or no. As long as you live, it will be an un unsolved riddle in your mind. Winston lay still. His breast rose and fell a little faster. He still had not asked the question that had come into his mind the first. He had got to... He had got to ask it, and yet it was as though his tongue would not utter it. There was a trace of amusement in O'Brien's face. Even his spectacles seemed to wear an ironical gleam. He knows, thought Winston. Suddenly, he knows what I am going to ask. At the thought, the words burst out of him. What is in room 101? The expression on O'Brien's face did not change. He answered dr dryly. You know what is in room 101, Winston. Everyone knows what is in room 101. He raised a finger to the man in the white coat. Evidently, the session was at an end. A needle jerked into Winston's arm. He sank almost instantly into deep sleep. And that's the end of that chapter. Um, we've been going about an hour and a half. I There are 25 pages left. I am going to go ahead and leave it off there. We'll finish the book in the next session. And um, let's see who is around. I am not going to game tonight. I'm just going to call it there. Um, Mr. Blitzer is playing The Witcher 3, Wild Hunt. Yeah, let's go on over to Mr. Blitzer for a few minutes. Bear with me. Hang out just a few minutes. And we will head on over there. And I thank you for coming and hanging out. There we are. And I will see you over there. Beneath, kill girl eyes. Beneath.
Good work. How you doing? 